Okay, thank you, Alan. Thanks, everybody, for being there t tonight. Uh, for those of you who are new, I see a, a few new names. Um, welcome to Made for Greatness virtual events here in COVID World Regina in the in the bustling town of uh, province of Saskatchewan. We started in 2017 with a retreat to unpack that quote that's attributed to Pope Benedict is the world offers you comfort, but you're not made for comfort, you're made for greatness. And that idea of greatness is the greatness of God himself, not some sort of a, a worldly thing, but uh, the greatness of God. And we have to, to allow God into our lives that we're created for, our hearts need to be stretched. And what uh, St. Augustine calls the vinegar in our hearts must be purged so that m there's more and more room for God and his greatness in our hearts and into our lives. So that's what we're doing. Um, so welcome, Alan. I, uh, I'm, I'm not going to say too much of your bio. I'm going to let you take it away. And Alan, um, you're from Ontario. And you run the um, Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, J. Sheen Society. Is that correct? Is that what it's called? Yeah, it's actually called um, a mission society. It's got a, it's got one of the longest names of any um, URL file. It's the Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen Mission Society of Canada uh, is technically the title of the organization. Uh, but more people know me for uh, being the uh, creator of bishopsheentoday.com. And that is the flagship of where I share uh, Archbishop Sheen's writings, his teachings on that website, bishopsheentoday.com. So um, that's, I think, where more people know me. Uh, the Mission Society was set up back in 2012 uh, as a way for me to um, kind of uh, announce my travels where I would uh, lecture at the seminaries, give parish missions, um, and of course uh, participate at Catholic conferences. So uh, people always like to see pictures, they like to see what you're doing. So uh, the Mission Society website was set up to kind of keep track of me, but um, uh, pretty well day in and day out, I spend more time on bishopsheentoday.com uh, to share Sheen's videos, his uh, uh, library of his audio reflections, and to many of his um, of course, uh, books that he uh, was a prolific writer. Of course, I think um, uh, some people say 66 books, I say 90, but uh, let's just say Bishop Sheen wrote a great deal. So, uh, so that's kind of the, um, the nutshell. Um, you know, my day job, I'm a plumber. I'm um, known as the pipe padre or the gas man. So uh, I am a man of trade. And so uh, uh, the good Lord has allowed me to feed my family through uh, my labors. And so, um, I'm going to, of course, uh, start my video here and uh, show you <laughs> who I am. I think a lot of people uh, know my voice more than my face. So um, uh, that's the difference. So when people finally meet me for the first time, they usually say, oh, I thought you were taller. I thought you were older. <laughs> so uh, that's the joy of being on radio. And um, uh, again, you have to guess what people look like. So, uh, But for myself, because I make regular appearances on uh, EWTN Television, Shalom TV. Uh, I'm always speaking at Catholic conferences, it seems, because now everything's gone digital. That's all we do is uh, what conferences this weekend. Uh, right now, I'm speaking at the Spiritual Rosary Pilgrimage, which is a large um, online um, event with about, uh, I think they're up to 50,000 uh, pilgrims that have signed up for this pilgrimage and uh, it's a four week long pilgrimage where every day we pray the rosary together. Uh, a number of the speakers give uh, meditation on the various mysteries of the rosary and um, you know I've got a talk coming up this weekend on the power of the rosary and so um, again and I led a rosary last week during the pilgrimage so um, again these online conferences seem to be the norm now it's kind of the way the church is going so um, again zoom seems to be <laughs> where we're at uh, on a regular basis so all right uh, but in a nutshell I always try to say is that I'm a father a grandfather a man of trade um, retreat master author. I have two books to my credit, soon to be a third book, and um, radio host, uh, a jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> uh, my wife calls me a renaissance man because, um, you know, I kind of uh, take too many tasks and try to do the best I can to juggle those tasks, but still, um, with God's help, you can do anything. 
you can do anything. So uh, anyway, that's a short bio. Um, I will give you a little insight that I'm one of 12 children and so I'm well adjusted and uh, I, again, uh, my needs are small. I learned very quickly to have a spirit of gratitude and uh, so I'm easy to please. Uh, give me a bit of coffee. Life's good. Life's good. Well, I have no, I have no coffee to give you, but as you see his name in, on your screen, Darcy Donovan has popcorn. Okay, very good. <laughs> very. But good. I, I had asked you uh, when when we were ta asking you to to share with us tonight. I'd asked you three questions, and if you could elaborate on these questions, one was, "What has God done in your life? What is He doing with you currently? And where do you see that He's leading you?" Um, and your it. Uh, I, I think I would love to hear more about that and see how exactly God has moved in your life. And um, as everybody sees, hopefully everybody sees that it's being recorded this evening. Uh, Alan has recording on his end. So he's going to be some, do a little bit of editing from his part and ours is going to be more raw and it'll be on our Facebook page. If anybody wants to watch it later on, you're going to be welcome to. Um, so um, Alan, how's God moving in your life, Alan? Right. What's he done for you in the past? Well, I, I have to go back to um, the moment of conception. And, um, you know, I find out these stories through my mother uh, later on, and you really truly see the hand of God. And um, I have to say, I am one of 12 children. And uh, my mom, of course, um, uh, was never that healthy. She was always kind of a sickly woman. And um, she's still alive today, but every time she got pregnant, uh, she would end up in the hospital and uh, many times uh, be near death. And so when um, she conceived my eldest brother, Mark, um, of course, she uh, was in the hospital for three months after she gave birth. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she gave uh, birth to my, um, my, the second born, uh, my brother, Steve, um, she was in the hospital for six months after she gave birth because um, her kidneys fail. And uh, so again, she just didn't seem to be that great uh, at giving birth. It's just she paid a heavy price. And so when uh, I am the third born uh, son, and when uh, she conceived me, uh, the doctors pleaded with her to abort me. And uh, they kept saying to her, you know, um, Mrs. Smith, you have to abort this child because you've almost died twice. And if you carry this uh, pregnancy to term, uh, you'll probably die this time, you know, um, kind of like three strikes you're out. And uh, so throughout that pregnancy, my mom kept uh, fighting for my life. She kept uh, saying to the doctors, no, I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm going to trust in the Lord. And uh, she delivered a 10 pound baby. And uh, I came and um, my mom was well. Of course, she had a few problems, uh, but I knew right from the beginning uh, that the devil wanted my life snuffed out. He wanted me out of here. Um, and uh, so that was a very powerful story that my mom told me. And uh, I remember that because we are in this spiritual battle. It's about good versus evil. And of course, we hear of stories where even St. John Paul II, um, they pleaded with his mother to abort him. And so, uh, you know, you look throughout history, you see these situations where mothers uh, defended the child. And of course, uh, saints were born. And um, hopefully be the same one day. Well, you never know, right? So, uh, so right away from my birth, I knew, okay, something's going on here. Uh, and then um, on the day of my baptism, my mother and father um, presented me, of course, um, to the priest to be baptized, but they made a consecration and they entrusted me into the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And they did this for almost all of their children. But it was that entrustment that I didn't even know took place that uh, when I look at my devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and my devotion to the Immaculate Heart and the spiritual benefits that I've received, um, I have to thank my parents for that little entrustment that they made on the day of my baptism. And uh, again, these things that parents do in secret, um, do them, do them. Consecrate your children to uh, the Immaculate Heart, the Sacred Heart. Um, a, just encourage them to entrust their lives to St. Joseph, to the Blessed Virgin Mary. All of these things pay big dividends later on in life. And uh, also just in your, in your infancy, um, I saw the, uh, the hand of God in my early childhood. And again, it was through these entrustments to the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart. So uh, right away, those two um, 
I say the first year of my life, a lot happened. And um, again, I could see where the hand of God was. Um, as hey, I, Ellen, yeah. just, you mentioned when you were young that um, your mom had told you about what had happened or what the doctors were encouraging her to do. How old were you when, you, when she told you that? Um, I would have been uh, probably about eight or nine years old. Uh, because again, you have to come to the age of reason. And, and um, I had lost uh, a brother and a sister um, during, you know, the early years. And so um, my, um, these were all my younger brothers and sisters, but um, my brother Glennie uh, passed away after a month. And uh, the seventh child that was born, my sister Anne Marie, uh, also passed away after a month. And uh, so uh, my parents really, uh, presented this as a real blessing uh, to say that you have a brother and a sister interceding for you and the whole family. And so this uh, whole catechesis of where do we go after uh, we die, um, the soul is animated and it stays busy. Um, so we really understood that uh, there is something eternal to all of us. And uh, again, this is a God incidence that happens in many families' lives. They lose children uh, but it's always a matter of turning it for the good and my parents took that opportunity and uh, really um, said to us every day you have a brother and a sister interceding for you in heaven and I still feel their presence today my brother Glennie and my sister Anne Marie uh, still very much a part of my life so and when I say I'm one of 12 children uh, two of my you know siblings are in heaven I truly believe that uh, both baptized, both, of course, uh, busy, because uh, there's a lot of us. So, uh, again, these are our stories my mother told me, of course, at the age of reason. And, um, you know, I think it was a crazy household with 12 children. Uh, there's going to be the characters. Uh, but I also uh, was blessed, and my parents were foster parents. And um, uh, my mother says we had 44 foster children. And I remember uh, these um, children coming into our lives. Some of them would stay for a month, some two months, but uh, my parents really showed us what brokenness was, that these foster children were coming from broken families. And so we really appreciated the um, upbringing we were receiving. And we realized, hey, uh, we've got it all pretty good here. Someone has it worse than us. And uh, so they exposed us to uh, what a broken family is. Uh, and again, our role to help people. So uh, again, my parents, um, again, were um, building us up in a beautiful way, uh, just with our life experience. And so uh, foster kids uh, coming and going. Um, and then of course, my parents started to volunteer us in the community. And I think many parents can relate to that. Uh, we want to keep our kids busy. We want them to be um, good citizens. We, I grew up in that um, um, generation where parents want to make their children good citizens, right? And so my mom and dad wanted us to be good citizens. So volunteering was, was part of that. And my mother would volunteer me at the psychiatric hospitals. And uh, so I remember spending all those years visiting the psych boards and uh, just volunteering, but seeing brokenness again uh, in families' lives. And so um, I had a real heart for the suffering. And uh, it's really helped me in my ministry to know that, hey, uh, you don't know the history of people. You don't know the wounds they have. You don't know the experiences, but you meet them where they're at and just trust that uh, you'll be able to help them in some way. And uh, so just a blessed soul to have that um, set of parents that uh, thrust us into uh, these leadership roles. And my mom always volunteered me uh, to lead the youth group or to read in church. And I never forget, uh, I was about 14 years old and I read in church and uh, a gentleman came up to me and he said, I just want to say to you, young man, that you have a very soothing voice and that God will use your voice in a very powerful way um, when you grow up. And as a teenager, I'm just looking at this a man saying, what's he talking about? You know, <laughs> you know, I was an altar server for years and people would come and pat you on the head and say, oh, you're going to be a priest one day or something like that. But uh, this um, school teacher came up to me and uh, affirmed uh, a talent that God had given me. And uh, here I am, uh, years later, been on the radio for almost 20 years. And people say to me all the time, you have a very soothing voice. 
uh, you have this very special gift of your voice. And uh, again, I just thank the Lord. But um, I always say to people, if you see a young man or a young girl that has a talent, affirm them. Affirm them. It's amazing what it can do for that soul. And uh, again, I thank that teacher that um, uh, recognized something in me and said, work on it, encourage you to just um, move in that direction, but you have something. So I was grateful to um, that school teacher for uh, that moment. And I look back now and say, yeah, God had his hand on me again and again and again. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the teenage years were crazy years, of course, with my brothers and, uh, you know, I've got six brothers. So uh, you let six boys go out and play so we can get into a lot of trouble. But, um, you know, this is not one of these things where I was in jail every week or anything. It was just a rambunctious house of, of young men. And, um, you know, the faith was uh, central to our home. Uh, my mom and dad, uh, of course, gathered us for the family rosary every night. And uh, we said it, you know, with great reservation. I don't think our heart was in it. Um, but again, my parents were faithful to that prayer life. And um, my mom and dad uh, were both daily communicants. And my dad would wake up at five in the morning, um, get everything ready, and then head off to church to go to church before he, he went to his uh, big job um, at the gas company. So my dad uh, was the budget manager. and um, But again, mass was important to him. And so he went off to early mass. And um, again, we'd always look at him saying, wow, he loves Jesus a lot. My dad, he's going to mass before he goes to work. And then my mom, of course, would take as many kids as she could find to go to daily mass before school started. And I got into the habit uh, since uh, grade one of going to daily mass. And so, um, again, I'm just blessed that way to uh, just somehow um, this love for the Eucharist started at a very early age in my life. I enjoyed going to mass. I knew um, I, the catechist that I had somehow awakened in me. Uh, the sense of the real presence. I got it. I got it at a young age. And um, again, it put me on this path of um, being fed, um, even though I, I didn't know I was being fed, but um, to just receive the Lord every day, grade one, grade two, I'm sorry, we started grade two, yeah, grade two, right through to grade eight. And, um, and then uh, we went to a public high school. And my mom and dad said, we're going to send you to a public high school, not a Catholic high school, because we want you to kind of be tested. We want you to be tested. And it was great. I'm, I'm really happy that my parents said to us, your faith is learned at home, not in that school, but your faith will be challenged at that school. And so uh, there I met many evangelicals and I started to realize that, hey, uh, there's a bit of a tension here between churches, you know, the evangelicals and the Catholics. And so I became a bit of a charismatic Catholic and uh, I always say charismaniac. That's what I would always say to people. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a charismaniac. But, um, you know, all through high school, I was um, very much involved in the renewal. And uh, I remember reading a book many years ago from a Madonna House priest. And he, uh, it was entitled um, Passing Through the Renewal. And I think it's important that people experience the charismatic renewal, even if it's for a year or a short time. There's something there to... Um, uh, to take from the renewal. And so if it's the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, but still, I think it's uh, very good for uh, people's formation. So I was blessed to pass through the renewal and uh, pick up things. And it helped me a great deal to interact with my evangelical brothers and uh, to kind of uh, be an apologist. And so I enjoyed doing that. So I uh, got through high school, went to college, studied business, um, you know, fell into all the sins that uh, it seems like college students do and um, kind of uh, always, I think, sometimes took too many free passes, uh, a get out of jail card. And I think as Catholics, sometimes we can play a very dangerous game in that we always think, oh, I can fall into mortal sin, but, you know, father's just down the road, I'll get to confession. And you live this very dangerous life, but knowing it now, how dangerous it was, but Again, sometimes uh, people's formation is like, oh yeah, you can get a gate out of jail card any time, you know. Uh, there's always confession before mass. So, um, you know, I regret uh, living that dangerous life, but uh, now I just try to warn my son and others to say, you know, don't play that game of uh, roulette, you know, uh, in a way. So uh, again, the good Lord got me through college 
And uh, of course, after college, he then helped me meet my wife of 35 years here. And um, uh, again, he knew he wanted to save me. And a lot of times what God does is he puts us with a very good holy woman and he sent me a very holy woman uh, who's still in my life. And so I'm blessed. And, um, you know, I think what the Lord did for me and my wife is we got connected into Madonna House, which is a, a bit of a Catholic community here in Ontario. And uh, there we learned the model of Nazareth. And so what was presented to me as a young man, as a newly married man, was the model of St. Joseph the Blessed Virgin Mary, and living uh, a life similar to Nazareth, uh, a hidden life, but still very much in, interacting in the community, having a solid prayer life, and using St. Joseph as my icon, my, my model. And I am, am a blessed man. I'm a man of trade. Um, you know, I got my business degree, but I also got my trade papers. And so uh, it was a beautiful combination. And I started my own business um, back in 1992. So, um, the good Lord kind of used my time, talent, and treasures and put them all together. And so I started a company called Al the Gas Man. But when my wife and I started to have children, uh, the children started to work in the family business. And having a son was a real blessing to have him since the age of five work under me. And uh, of course, I lived the dream. I lived the St. Joseph life, uh, daily mass every morning, holy hour. And of course, going to work and uh, raising a family. And um, here I am now with three adult children, all of them married, five grandchildren, uh, a son who took over my family business. And uh, again, always because we live that model of Nazareth. Um, and I was priest, prophet, and king. And my wife called me out. I think I was 25 years old. And she said, you're going to be the priest, prophet, and king of this home. Um, and uh, that's your role, and that's also your baptismal anointing. When you were baptized, you were claimed for Christ and anointed priest, prophet, and king. So take your position. Take your position. So um, my good wife has always called me out, and uh, I'm a blessed man. So uh, again, I sit here today saying, wow, the hand of God has been on me. Um, he, of course, uh, opened up a ministry to me. Uh, through a God incidence uh, with Bishop Sheen, um, you know, my mother, of course, volunteering me and always putting me in the limelight was just uh, somehow led me into uh, volunteering at a radio station uh, back in the uh, late 90s. And there, all of a sudden, I just developed this uh, love to be on the radio. And, uh, of course, in 2006, I was given an opportunity to host uh, a weekly radio show on the Holy Rosary. And uh, I'm still hosting that show even today. So here we are almost 15 years later, I'm still doing a weekly radio show, all because my mother and father uh, made me sing for my supper. And so it became very easy. And uh, that door opened. And again, a, a beautiful balance of family life, uh, community work, um, all of these things. So uh, God kind of opens some doors sometimes when you least expect it. And the same thing happened with Bishop Sheen. Um, of this ministry that I do was a God incident. Um, my wife and I were dropping one of our daughters off to a Catholic university, a little college called Our Lady Seat of Wisdom. And there it was in 2009. And um, my wife was in the uh, library and they had a box of free books. And uh, there was some Bishop Sheen books in there that they were giving away for free. And she picked up a book called Peace of Soul. And uh, she read me that book on the way home. It was a five hour drive. And the first line of that book was, unless souls are saved, nothing is saved. And when I heard that line, unless souls are saved, nothing is saved, it lit a spark in me. And I said, I love this man. I love this, uh, his way of words, uh, his, um, you know, his vision. Uh, it's all about souls. And I thought, who talks about saving souls anymore? Um, I loved it when I was a teenager because that's the language we spoke. All my evangelical friends were saying, are you saved? Are you saved? Let's go save some souls. And it kind of reawakened in me this desire to save souls. And so uh, that little God incidence in 2009, uh, where my wife picked up a little book and she read that book to me on the way home. Uh, all of a sudden, I just started to read Bishop Sheen books uh, one after the other. And, you know, within two years, I had read 24 of his books. And um, I then went to the radio station where I'd been hosting this Holy Rosary show since 2006 
And so in 2012, I went to my producer and said, could I do a Bishop Sheen hour? And I started to replay his old talks and um, boy, that just took off. And, um, you know, all of a sudden a radio station in Toronto wanted me to simulcast the show and then Radio Maria called me. And so uh, the next thing you know, all these doors are opening up all because of God incident in 2009. So um, again, the hand of God is upon me. Um, that's, of course, how he led me up to today. And, um, you know, I think uh, the second question he asked me is, uh, what's God doing today in my life? And he's got me busy just uh, sharing Bishop Sheen. Um, you know, Archbishop Sheen spent the last 10 years of his life uh, giving retreats. Uh, he knew that the key to the renovation of the church and the salvation of souls was to renew the priesthood, was to, uh, you know, uh, energize, engage, um, just tell everybody that your life is worth living. I mean, all those years on television, the name of the show was Life is Worth Living. And he wanted to say to all of us, God has a plan for you. And, you know, he came into this world, uh, he took on human flesh, and he went to the cross and died for us. That is a great story. Let's rejoice. And you could almost see, he had almost like a Cheshire smile, like a, a Cheshire cat smile a lot of times. And he was just be just gleaming and uh, just glowing because he had something and you said, I want what he's got. I want what he's got. And the church doubled in size in the 1950s. And I, I believe a lot of it had to do with Fulton Sheen um, because he engaged the culture with uh, this great love story. God so loved the world that he sent his son to die on the cross. And he would talk about current affairs and always bring Christ into the conversation. And so, of course, he's a great holy inspiration for me. And as a man of trade visiting uh, tens of thousands of peoples and going into their houses to fix their pipes, I get to bring the gospel, all the books that I've read about Bishop Sheen. I get to kind of share those stories with people. Uh, so he has been a great coach for me and uh, just helped me along in my um, ability to um, just be a good catechist, but also a good apologist. And so I'm busy uh, just... Um, I just plugging people in. That's what I love to do. I want to introduce Bishop Sheen to a whole new generation of viewers, listeners, and readers. And, you know, I've been blessed in that um, uh, Bishop Daniel Jenke from Peoria, Illinois, reached out to me in 2013 and asked me to sit on the board of directors for the Sheen cause. This is the cause for his canonization. And I accepted that position. I'm the only non-American um, on that board of directors. And um, again, Father Andrew Apostoli, and many of you may remember him from EW10, God Rest His Soul. Um, he said, I do not want to see Archbishop Sheen's voice go silent. We need people like yourself to just keep championing the cause, to keep sharing Sheen's uh, writings, his uh, great, um, uh, just this uh, treasure house of uh, wisdom and knowledge keep sharing it. Let it not go silent. Let's keep putting Bishop Sheen out in front of people's eyes. And uh, again, it's been a bit, a bit of battle cry for us. And I always remember. So uh, I wake up every day with a mission to share Bishop Sheen. So uh, that's what God has me doing today. Of course, being a grandfather of five grandchildren, that's, that's keeps me going. I've uh, passed my business over to my son. I always say, call me if you need me. Um, I'm still waiting for the call. <laughs> he doesn't call me. Uh, so if my son doesn't call me to help him out, I'll help the church out and uh, do some lecturing and some sharing uh, of Bishop Sheen's wisdom. So uh, that's what God has me doing today. Uh, of course, um, radio, television, lecturing. Uh, with COVID, pretty well, everything's digital now. And I'm just working on my third book uh, to release um, in the new year. So um, Again, I've really enjoyed writing. I've enjoyed uh, writing articles for Catholic Exchange Magazine, um, kind of using that uh, gift of some of putting things to, to paper. And I think uh, there are those people that love to read. So um, trying to um, you know, satisfy that appetite of the readers out there. So um, again, that keeps me busy. Keeps me busy just being a grandfather, a husband, a writer, a lecturer. So, uh, but I'm doing, um, I think the last question that you asked me is, 
where is God taking me? And I really think he's taking me to do more, um, to lead retreats. Um, you know, I have all of Sheen's knowledge up in here and a lot of it in my heart. And, um, you know, I say to people all the time, I said, um, you know, Bishop Sheen was the first priest to make me feel guilty for my sin. He was able to get into my head to show me what my sin did to our Lord on the cross and the pain that I caused his mother, uh, this great sorrow to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And uh, he guilted me. He guilted me in a beautiful way uh, to stir my heart. And I thank God for Fulton Sheen that he did that to me. And of course, that love of his seven last words and the wisdom that he imparted to the world um, by giving the seven last words. And Archbishop Sheen unpackaged the seven last words for uh, close to 60 years, his Lenten retreats, his Good Friday addresses. I'm picking up the ball and um, trying to reintroduce um, those Lenten retreats, those uh, beautiful meditations. And so God, I think, has me uh, putting on more retreats, even if they're just online courses, um, online presentations. But uh, I pretty well have a lot of that stuff down in my heart and in my head to share. And so I think that's where God's going to take me is just more retreat work and uh, just plugging people into the, I want to say the good stuff of Fulton Sheen. Now, I mean, he wrote books on communism. He wrote books on science. Um, you know, he wrote on everything. But I really think the crown jewel is his writings on prayer and his writings on the seven last words. And uh, my newest book is going to be on the sacraments uh, because uh, Fulton Sheen wanted to leave us with uh, almost like a, a time capsule to say, if you guys forget, here's the, here's the playbook. This is what the sacraments are about. Uh, read this and you'll be able to reawaken um, uh, this need of the sacraments in society. Because we're a sacramental people. Sometimes we forget it. We forget it. So uh, again, I think that's where God's taken me. So, and hopefully he's taken me to heaven. And, um, you know, I, I say to people all the time, I'm blessed to have consecrated myself to uh, the blessed, to, of course, to Jesus through the Blessed Virgin Mary. And um, in my early years, uh, my good wife and I uh, saw the need of uh, doing the Montfort uh, formula of consecration. Um, and so as a young man, I had consecrated myself to Our Lady, became a slave uh, to Our Lady. And so I've learned to not resist her uh, so much. And uh, she knows what she's doing. And so that entrustment to her. And of course, I always had a great devotion to St. Joseph for many years. And uh, many people are now doing the consecration to St. Joseph through um, Father Calloway. And um, so, of course, being consecrated to St. Joseph too. So uh, it's all good. It's all good. These three beautiful holy hearts, I like to say, the heart of Jesus, the heart of Mary, and even the heart of Joseph. So uh, it's a good formula to um, ensure your success, I like to say. So, all right. Hopefully that's a good little starter. And of course, uh, I'm always here to answer questions and to um, uh, just be present. And uh, I think uh, with my website, bishopsheentoday.com, many people have visited that site. I have a, a million viewers every year that come to the site. So um, kind of blown away by this, something I thought up of in 2012, um, has that many people coming to look at Sheen, read Sheen, listen to Sheen. So uh, I'm a blessed man there, that's for sure. I, I have a couple of questions for you, Al. Okay. Uh, the, uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned several things I'd, I'd like to ask you to elaborate on a little bit. For starters, I, I don't know if, how familiar everybody is with Madonna House. You mentioned Madonna House a few times. We have some people on this on this um, video conference or whatever you want to call it that are actually uh, um, members of Madonna House. So I, I don't want to take their thunder, but since you have the floor, I, I, I want to ask you, um, now Madonna House has Marian centers throughout the entire world. And um, they do a lot of really good work in different places, they have focuses on different types of ministry. In Regina, they, they serve food to men here in, in the city here. How would you summarize the apostolate of Madonna House? And let's say 30 seconds or less, how would you summarize their apostolate? Because it sounds like it was really impactful for you and your wife, particularly. Um, why would somebody, let's say if I've never heard of them, why would I want to be involved with them in a way? 
any well, uh, what's your what's your response yeah i always just say um you'll know uh, their ministry by their fruits and what madonna house has is like you say it's it's got many uh various forms of outreach and so one of the madonna house um apostolates was to families and there would be family retreats sometimes they would call them cana colony or a nazareth family retreat and so uh, many uh, families had been going up to madonna house for years and when we were newly married uh, a couple reached out to us and said you should come up to madonna house with us bring you know uh, we were just newly married and going up without children and then when we had children we would connect into the madonna house community uh, through their outreach to families and uh, when you're there you start to uh, see the stories of um, Catherine Doherty uh, and her husband Father Eddie and so you uh, start to read her books and start to get an idea of wow um, this is a woman that came from Russia the Baroness and uh, you know just reached out and um, just served the poor and um, a beautiful holy example and so uh, we just connected to a vibrant community and so um, you know we just go up uh, every summer for a retreat and get plugged in and so uh, again the Madonna House um, um, outreach that was there I mean there's other things going on too they have a, a pre-sem program they have of course the the Madonna House apostolate itself where people come and um, you know commit their lives live in the community um, so there's lots of uh, arms to Madonna House I call it they have a great publishing uh, um, a leg where they of course have beautiful publications so uh, there's stuff but uh, one of my favorite things is uh, just a little prayer card I received from Madonna House saying I am third and uh, that little prayer card that I have on my fridge I am third just kind of sets me straight every day God first others second myself third and uh, I tell you, it's it's one of my mottos. I am third, and another one is love serves. Um, we're here to serve um, with great love. And um, so again, it was just one of these things. I mean, the Lord let it happen. I'm glad, and they're still there, and uh, always uh, ready to receive pilgrims like myself. And uh, again, their outreaches in Toronto, and as you say, in other areas, Regina. So um, again, you know, it's of God when it has again it's fruits and you see it's fruits even today far and wide so that's beautiful i know my life has been impacted very positively by the men and women who serve with madonna house i, I love these people they're my family um and in a few moments i i have to tell everybody a little bit that i made a brief mistake when i was setting this up and i uh so later in, in a few minutes i'm going to unmute everybody if you want to be um have your video unmuted you go right ahead the reason for that is I like to open the floor a little bit. There's not a lot of us, so I don't think we'll have any bandwidth issues. But I'm not going to, if you don't want your video on, I'm not going to force it on. But I'd like to give everybody an opportunity to maybe engage Al directly. Um, well, you had mentioned some things, Al. As you also mentioned the charismatic renewal, or you mentioned it as the renewal. And sometimes when I hear about the charismatic renewal, um, of course, it doesn't mean that, uh, well, and let me back that up a little bit. Sometimes people assume that, that means everybody's got to speak in tongues. Everybody's got to be raising their hands in the air. Is that in your mind, is that what the charismatic renewal is all about? Or how would you summarize its impact on yours and your, and your wife's life? Um, I would say that, um, again, I needed to uh, plug into the life of the spirit seminars, which I think are very important. And I, I think of, again, the fruits of the charismatic renewal. Now, um, Again, many people just come for a couple of years and then move on. And that was, in my case, um, it was very much uh, five years of my life through high school. Uh, but when I was newly married, we, I wasn't connected to the charismatic renewal at all. But when I plugged into the renewal, um, it was very important. I think what um, it was serving uh, me for was to fall in love with my Bible. Um, that was one of the fruits of being involved with the charismatic renewal, their love of scripture, because uh, what did they say? Knowledge is, um, when you don't know your scriptures, you don't know God, right? I mean, some saint said that or something. It was, it's uh, Saint Jerome. It, Saint Jerome. Ignorance yeah. of scripture is ignorance of ignorance Christ. Of God. Okay, so um, got my scriptures down, started to read my scriptures. Um, the fruits and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, to me, I just prayed for the wisdom. Wisdom, I, I mean, I, I wasn't really important about receiving the gift of tongues or the gift of healing. I just wanted 
I knew I wanted to pray for wisdom. And that was something I just wanted to keep tapping into that. I mean, I wanted to receive every gift that God would give me. And, you know, I believe that you're given all the gifts and uh, fruits of the Holy Spirit. It's just that they're in packaging and you have to unpackage it. Okay. It's there. But a lot of times people receive the gifts and just leave it um, underneath the Christmas tree. Um, but if you take that and say, I want to work with this, I want to get to know this gift and uh, unpackage it, um, it can really work in your life. So um, being exposed to the gifts and the fruits of the Holy Spirit, understanding what they are, how you can use them in your life, how you can use them in ministry. Um, and again, praying for God to continue to release the Holy Spirit. And I love that short little prayer. Come Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well beloved spouse. Uh, always ask the Holy Spirit to come. And um, again, it's one of these things where, uh, as I said, it was a Madonna House priest that wrote a beautiful book. I think it was Father Wild about passing through the renewal. Um, and, and that was my case. I got to pass through the renewal and take many uh, good things from it. So um, I get it. I get it. So um, again, I recommend it to everyone if they can find it. And th this is the whole thing is it kind of disappeared a little bit. Um, and again, I don't know if that's just, again, I can't really, I don't really have a, a definitive answer of why the renewal um, um, disappeared, if that's right. It hasn't disappeared, but in many churches that used to have uh, prayer groups and, uh, you know, kind of large communities, they've seen to have uh, petered out a great deal. So um, I'm not saying it's underground, but there are charismatic groups, don't get me wrong. Um, it's just that you've got to go looking for them. <laughs> you have to go looking for them. They're not in every parish anymore, it seems. You know, I've, something that's interesting about that is I find it's very regional and where it's not actively present. And I, when I talk to some of the engaged Catholics in those areas where it's not actively present, they almost mock it sometimes or else they kind of pat it on the head, you know, good, you know, good for you. That's okay. Um, it's interesting that the first speaker that we had to kick off our made for greatness ministries at the time, he was the president of the international Catholic charismatic renewal services in Rome. And that was his main um, lowercase V vocation at that time that, um, and I remember asking him this very question on this issue about not really being very active or prominent in certain areas. And he said, you know, you go to these different parts of the world where they're less um, advanced, economically advanced, technologically advanced, and the charismatic renewal is on fire. He said, you have people being raised from the dead every day, almost like breathing. I think he was being a little euphemistic. Um, you have healing and miracles happening over the world in places other than the West. And, you know, I wonder if maybe it has something to do with people seeing a need for inviting God in a deeper way into our lives. You know, maybe saying that come Holy Spirit prayer, come into my life, transform my life, um, make me, uh, make room in my heart for your greatness. Mm -hmm. I have no yeah. doubt that that's where I'm in or going. You're going to say something, else? Yeah, and, and, but th this is why I use the term charismaniac. Um, just yeah. to uh, um, break the ice, to make people laugh, because they, you know, they're nervous about it. There's maybe a tension, but a lot of times when I say, you know, um, I hung out with the charismaniacs for a couple of years, then all of a sudden they get, they laugh and chuckle, and now we can continue the conversation to say, oh, and here's what I found, and here's what I'm still using today. And, um, you know, I'm glad to see some people still interested in a Life in the Spirit seminar and to, um, you know, I think because a lot of times we're running off our, what I call grade three catechism. And this is a, a reality uh, amongst Catholics is that uh, really the catechesis a lot of time is their, you know, grade two and grade three catechism. Uh, of course, when they prepare for their first Holy Communion and the sacrament of confession and their grade eight catechism when they prepare for confirmation. Um, and think about it. That's a lot of times uh, once they're confirmed, they're done. They're done. There's no more catechesis. Um, they're running off of what I call their grade eight catechism. And so a life in the spirit seminar uh, for a young adult uh, can be a great uh, refresher course. It can be um, just what the doctor ordered is a catechesis. And I think as young men, uh, young adults, we're, we're now finding that. We're saying, I need catechesis. 
I do. And that's why for me, Bishop Sheen uh, is so important because he wrote a catechism. Uh, he took uh, the time to make 26 albums, uh, 50 lessons, and it's called the Sheen Catechism. And uh, people listen to that 26 hours of instruction. And in fact, Bishop Sheen um, said, if you want to be a Catholic under my watch, you got to do 26 hours with me. <laughs> so there's no free pass here. There's no, um, you know, cheat, uh, you know, go pass, go. <laughs> no, um, you got to put the time in, put the time in. So uh, that's what I love about Sheen. He wrote a catechism and he was serious about catechesis. And I think that's what we need to do too is, uh, remember, most people have only a grade eight catechism. Let's connect them in. Let's get them started again, kickstart something. Um, so I'd love to hear more about your ministry with uh, Fulton Sheen, but you had mentioned also in passing that you just met your wife and it was just sort of planted in the middle of the story. And I'd love to hear a little bit, if you could elaborate how you met your wife and uh, maybe your journey leading up to it. Cause some of our men in our community here um, are still struggling with that desire of wanting to get married, but not really finding anybody that, um, that they can have a relationship with. Let's, if you wouldn't mind unpacking that a little bit, how you met your wife or did she just sort of land in your life no, in one day? No, no. <laughs> how did it go? Yeah. So again, go back to my mother and father. Um, and I remember I was 14 years old. And so of course, all of, you know, a couple of my brothers and sisters now we're starting to date and, um, you know, we're kind of, you know, seeing uh, the opposite sex on the horizon. And so, um, you know, for, for my sisters and my brothers and, you know, the parents coming together and saying, okay, now children, listen up. You need to pray that God will send you your spouse. Okay. That, that that's one of your prayer intentions now is that you're going to start praying every day that the Lord will send you a Holy spouse. And most likely, um, the Lord will send you your spouse at church. So be looking at church because they were trying to uh, coach us in a good way saying, you know, you, you want to be equally yoked. If you're going to mass every Sunday and you're praying your rosary, get someone that's kind of is wired for sound like you are. Make it easy on yourself. And um, so my mom and dad said, keep praying for your future wife. And so I started praying for a wife at 14. And I kept saying, Lord, um, you know the inventory. You know the inventory. Okay, there's 3 billion girls out there and me. Okay, you, you, you made them all. So, you know, the inventory um, in your gut, perfect timing, let this happen, right? And sure enough, um, I think I was, 22, I was 22 at the time. I met my wife outside of Maple Leaf Gardens at a beautiful charismatic rally. It was called the Fire Rally. And uh, they had uh, Ralph Martin, Father Bertolucci, Sister Ann Shields uh, giving talks at Maple Leaf Gardens. The place was full. Um, you know, they put 15,000 uh, charismaniacs in there. <laughs> and I was running a youth group in Oshawa, Ontario. And my uh, friend at the time was running a youth group in Cambridge, Ontario. And I said to him, you bring your youth group. I'll bring my youth group. We'll meet out front. Uh, we'll have, uh, you know, a meal after. And sure enough, my friend brought my future wife uh, there. And we met outside of Maple Leaf Gardens. Um, you know, right away, I thought, okay. Yeah, this, this has potential here. And uh, she lived uh, two hours away from me. And I said to the Lord, I said, oh, how is this ever going to work out, right? And uh, funny how God works. Uh, at the time, I was managing a Wendy's restaurant in Toronto. And uh, my, ma my general manager came up to me and says, we're looking for young uh, men to go to Guelph, Ontario, to open up a few restaurants there. And you're young and energetic. Would you do that? And sure enough, I got a transfer and I actually found an apartment uh, one minute walk away from my future wife. And the Lord said, I'll take this two hour um, drive and I'll make it one, one minute, a one minute walk. And he set up the whole uh, romance and courtship and made it easy. Um, and that's another one of my prayers that I pray every day. I say, Lord, make it easy, <laughs> make it easy, right? And I sometimes make the sign of the cross and I say, make it easy. <laughs> so he made it easy. Um, again, that meeting in front of Maple Leaf Gardens, a job transfer that put me into an apartment that was one minute walk from her apartment. We got to date, we got to get to know each other. And of course, we had plugged into her youth group. Um, so I had met friends there already. So he gave me friends to, to connect with. Um, of course, a beautiful wife. And again, it was an answer to prayer that started when I was 14 years old, because my parents said, you need to pray 
for your wife. So uh, pray that God's holy will be done. So uh, it was a nine year prayer, but um, the Lord said, you be faithful, I'll be faithful. And in the end, it'll work out. So um, here we are 35 years later, still married and uh, uh, God is good. God is good. Very neat. So what I hear you saying is I have to be a Toronto Maple Leafs fan and I have to work at Wendy's to find a wife. Is that, is that what you're telling me? Well, that helps. That helps. I mean, it's, it, God does it a different way sometimes, you know, for other people. Yeah. Uh, Montreal Canadian fans, there's a few. They, they actually end up with good holy wives. <laughs> I like to say holy wives, but they, they, God has mercy on Montreal Canadian fans, you know. Um, and, and Vancouver Canuck fans. And, uh, and, and, and God fans. tolerates the Toronto fans, the Maple Leaf fans. He does, fans. he, he does. You know? yeah. Well, you know the Catholic connection between the Toronto Maple Leafs. I mean, um, it's the only franchise that has produced uh, numerous vocations for the priesthood uh, because, uh, of course, Toronto Maple Leafs has a connection to St. Michael's College, um, which is the Catholic school. And uh, the, they brought all of the great stars, the Frank Mahalages, the Davy Keons, the Jerry Cheevers, all of those great NHL um, stars that we know and love all went to St. Mike's. And so uh, thank you, Catholic Church, for making great hockey players. And of course, I can say with uh, great confidence, the Toronto Maple Leaf is God's team. It's God's team because we have all of this great spiritual fruit. Um, what other NHL franchises produce priests? Toronto Maple Leaf has, we have. So uh, there is a connection with God. And of course the Blessed Mother's Colors and all this other stuff. So it's all good, you know. But again, that's another show. We can talk hockey another time, okay. <laughs> but you know, um, and I, I do have Toronto Maple Leaf jerseys that say Jesus Mary Joseph on the back uh, because we had Curtis Joseph as our goalie and he was number 31. And when they traded Curtis Joseph away, I, I was quite upset. And so I added Jesus Mary Joseph to my jersey. And I still wear that jersey proudly uh, to, uh, of course, say the names of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. And it was actually, um, again, the founder of the Companions of the Cross, a um, uh, great priest, of course. Um, he, of course, would be a, he was a great supporter of the Ottawa Senators. And uh, when any, he would go to hockey games, he would always, and this was Father Bedard, um, he would say that if he ever heard anybody swearing and using the name of Jesus in vain, he'd always kind of finish the sentence and he'd say, his name be praised. <laughs> or um, I always say, when I ever hear someone cuss and they say the name of Jesus, I always say, Mary Joseph. I just finish the line. I always say, well, I'm just finishing the sentence, you know. You said Jesus, I say Mary Joseph, the three most holy names, right? So uh, it's our way to uh, catechize at a hockey game, at a hockey game. So it's all good. And speak, speaking of catechizing, you mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one who'd love to hear a little bit more about Fulton Sheen, but you mentioned um, something about how uh, he brought on this sense of guilt for your own sin. In, in our world today, we try to touch approach sin with kid gloves, it seems, and I don't think it's working, but that seems to be the approach. And I don't want to make an indictment on a specific priest or maybe, you know, Catholic priest in general, I, you know, how would you say that Fulton Sheen would respond to our world today? Or do you think his messages would be the same or how would he be, how would his ministry be active in our world today? Yeah. Um, I might've mentioned earlier that one of Fulton Sheen's gifts was to bring Christ into the conversation. Um, like I'll give you an example. He would say something like this. He says, you know, I was at the awards uh, ceremony last night. And of course, everybody remembers uh, in 1952 when um, Bishop Sheen won the Emmy uh, for the most outstanding television personality. And when he received his award, he got up to the microphone and said, I want to thank my writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Of course, uh, brought the house down. Everybody laughed. But there he was on a stage taking that opportunity to bring everything to God, like to kind of bring the conversation to God. And uh, he was giving an interview and he was saying, um, you know, he says, uh, last night at this award ceremony, I noticed everybody was thanking their writers and thanking their relatives. But um, how many people really thank God uh, for the talent they have as actors, the voice they have as singers? Um, 
I didn't hear too many people thanking God. And he says, you know, it kind of reminds me uh, in sacred scripture when our Lord and Savior healed 10 lepers and they all went away and only one of them came back to thank him. Where's the nine? Where's the other nine? And he said, you know, kind of reminds me of that awards banquet last night. And it reminds me sometimes in our life's journey, how thankful are we to God? Uh, he heals us. He assists us. Yet we're like those nine lepers that just don't come back. And how do you, how does that make you feel? <laughs> you know, almost like a, you know, Dr. Phil, how does that make you feel? Because he would then make us go, yeah, I feel terrible because yeah, I'm like the nine. I, I never thank God. I don't do that. And so see, he got into me, he got into me. And of course he just brought the scriptures, brought it into the conversation and said, did you ever think about our Lord and the ingratitude? And then what about you? And then he go, I'm ungrateful too. I don't thank God enough. So that was how he did it with me. And um, so, you know, when I read this book called Victory Over Vice, uh, 1939, Sheen penned this book, and he took the seven deadly sins and used them as the antidote to the seven deadly sins. Um, sorry, so the seven last words of cross, sorry, I got that. It was the seven last words of our Lord spoke from the cross was the antidote for the seven deadly sins. And when I read that book cover to cover, I realized that I was suffering from all of the seven deadly sins. Uh, you know, the sin of anger, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was saying to us, get your anger under control. Uh, the Lord has forgiven you this huge debt. And he uses the example of the master who, of course, had the slave come to him and he says, pay me what you owe me. And he says, please, please, uh, I'll pay you everything. And he owed him a huge, like millions of dollars, it seemed, and he forgave him. And then he went down the hall and he throttled his buddy who owed him like 20 cents or something. And of course, we know what happened to that slave, right? But the Lord's forgiven you. Think about that great debt. And I started to realize, yes, the Lord has forgiven me so much stuff, showed me so much mercy. I need to extend that mercy to others, right? And so he took the scriptures, used our Lord's from the cross, applied it to my anger, and said, let's fix this. Let's fix this. Um, and it was the same for gluttony. You know, when he says the words, I thirst, uh, the Lord was making reparation. Uh, we are so gluttonous, not just for food, but drink and sports and entertainment. Um, our Lord's thirsting for a relationship, our time and our attention, and yet we're chasing all that other stuff. And those words from the cross, I thirst, and Sheen tying it into, um, you know, and he'd say two things that just, you know, that rocked my world at the time when I read it was, he says, you know, there's no more health clubs in America than there is spiritual retreat houses. And how many of you guys want to work out for two hours a day? But if I ask you to pray for five minutes, it's like we lose it. And he got my attention there too. And I'm going, yeah, I got it all wrong here. My priorities are all wrong. Uh, again, the gluttony I have for food, drink, sports, entertainment, and how much time I'm making for God. He got, he got me, he got in there and he used the scriptures to do that. And he did it for all those sins, for laziness when he says, I, it is finished. Uh, he was leading by example. He came and completed his mission. God the Father said, go into the world, save the world, give up your life. And Al Smith, what are you doing? What are you doing, right? Look what the Lord did and it's all this stuff. So, Again, that little book of the seven deadly sins and the seven last words is the antidote. Every one of it, he nailed it. He got me, of course, uh, very much um, uh, convinced that uh, you need to work on your sin. Sin is what is um, not only um, setting you back. Um, you know, we talk about conversion is, is that it's that turning around. Because every time we sin, we walk away from God. And so when you fall into the, those seven deadly sins, you walk away from God. It's that time to turn back and come to God. And uh, that's what Sheen encouraged me. He says, I want you to turn back to God and to turn away from your sin. And I'm going to remind you, so keep meditating on the seven last words, and that's going to be your therapy. 
And another thing that he presented in my life was the crucifix. And he said, um, you know, you need to start putting some of these in your life as a reminder. And uh, again, the famous line from Archbishop Sheen, he said, you can have a statue of a Buddha in your garden and you can rub the belly and feel all good, but you put a crucifix on your desk for three days, you just put it there for three days. It'll change you. It'll change you. Because you have to look upon the crucifix and say, I had something to do with this. My sin put our Lord on the cross. I'm guilty as charged. I'm guilty as charged. And at the foot of the cross is his mother, and she was losing her son because of you and your reckless behavior. Shame on you. Shame on you. You made your mother cry. You made his mother cry. Like, come on. And of course, you get moved to say, yeah, I feel terrible. Well, you're going to make your mom happy if you turn away from sin. And I said to you in sacred scripture, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Got that? Get on the program, okay? Keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments, okay? Um, listen to your mother. Listen to God the Father because he said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him, right? And what did the Blessed Virgin Mary say to us uh, at the wedding feast of Cana? Do whatever he tells you, okay? So God the Father is telling me, listen to him. The Blessed Virgin Mary is saying to me, do whatever he tells you. Look at your crucifix every day. Spend a little time with that. Ponder the seven last words. Now you got a program. Now you got a program. So uh, that's all I keep sharing to guys all the time. Get with the let's, program. Get with the program. Yeah. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, before we open up the floor to everybody, let's just say on that note, let's say just a quick re rededication prayer, just an impromptu prayer. Um, I know that for myself, Al, I, 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 can, I know where in my life that I'm not listening to God when he tells me, do whatever she tells you. I, I know that. And I, I keep doing it, kind of like St. Paul. I, I keep doing these things that I know I shouldn't do. Thank God for his grace. His grace is much bigger than all of this. The God of the universe through my baptism lives in me and lives in all of us. Um. Alan, would you mind leading us in a brief, really quick prayer to help us to rededicate our lives and to be encouraged to rise up to this, this finger point of God saying, do whatever your mother tells you. If you could just say a brief prayer yeah, for us, Alan. Yeah. I think the best prayer is the consecration prayer to our Lord, of course, through Our Lady, the beautiful mom for consecration. And I know it by heart, but it's such a powerful prayer when we just say, you know, I, Alan Smith, and I can say Daryl, Ian, Henry, Chris, Michael, everyone here, and, uh, you know, insert that name, but, you know, I, Alan, a faithless sinner, renew and ratify today into your hands, O Immaculate Mother, the vows of my baptism. I renounce forever Satan, his pomps, and his works. And I give myself entirely to Jesus Christ, the incarnate wisdom, to carry my cross after him all the days of my life and to be more faithful to him than I've ever been before. In the presence of you, O Blessed Mother, and all the heavenly court, I choose you this day as my mother and queen. I deliver and consecrate to you as your slave my body and my soul, my goods, both interior and exterior and even the value of all my good actions, past, present, and future, leaving to you the entire and full right of disposing of me and all that belongs to me, according to your good pleasure, for the greater glory of God in time and eternity. Amen. And that's the beautiful prayer. It's that consecration to Jesus through Mary, that entrustment, um, again, she will guide us to her son. And of course, she wants what's best for her children. And uh, when we entrust our lives to her, uh, she will not steer us uh, in any direction but to heaven. But to heaven. So uh, again, that's with the power of the consecration to our, our Lord, to Our Lady, using the formula of St. Louis de Montfort.
get with the program, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> my recommendation I mean, to everyone there. I mean, Alan, uh, you, you've been extremely generous with us this evening. Um, we're going to open the floor up in just a few moments here. Um, gentlemen, I'd like to con uh, encourage you to consider donating to Alan's ministry. We put a link up on our Facebook page, and Alan had mentioned the uh, website address in passing here in our meeting tonight. Um, please consider donating to him. He's been a, he's a very generous man, a very good man, and a very good role model for me, even though we've only had a handful of conversations. Uh, so, gentlemen, please consider doing that. Um, Alan, on that really quick note, what's your uh, what's your website address, the, the best website address for them yeah. to go to? I mean, the best one is bishopsheentoday.com. So we need Bishop Sheen today. And uh, there's the donate tab. I also have, um, you know, um, what I call the school of Sheen. Um, okay. We have monthly donors that uh, can donate $10 a month or $25 a month. And uh, those are the funds that we use to buy books for seminarians. We pay airtime costs to radio stations. We uh, pay our internet bill. I mean, just our um, host, uh, our server, um, all of that stuff that goes into it, programs. So those bills keep coming in. But um, again, that combination of radio airtime, seminarians, internet cost, um, this is what we raise money for. And so um, the Lord just keeps opening doors. I had a vocation director from the Diocese of London uh, reach out to me yesterday. He needs six books for um, some seminarians in the Diocese of London. Uh, so, of course, we'll send those books out to them, right? Um, and this, this request is on a regular basis. And I have digital libraries that I send to seminarians, to uh, people, of course, uh, just that reach out to me. I've got uh, every book that uh, Archbishop Sheen wrote scanned, every audio recording scanned. Um, you know, that I just send out in digital libraries for people as a thank you. Um, again, you can't even, you won't be able to read it all or listen to everything. Uh, maybe you can if you got time. But um, again, that's the beauty of technology. Uh, so again, I share digital downloads with people all the time. Uh, try to, of course, uh, just introduce Fulton Chain to a whole new generation of viewers and listeners and readers. And, and again, bishopsheentoday.com. Bishop Sheen, bishopsheentoday.com. Yeah. Excellent.